Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining me in this multi-part series of review videos about the XOR Electronics NerdSec. This possibly in-depth review will have to be split over maybe three or more videos. Multi-channel sequencers like this tend to be feature-packed, so it makes sense to get started with a high-level look at the device, then follow up with a detailed look uh, of dedicated videos to detailed look of all the features. And this is to allow us to better understand the possibility on offer and to allow you guys, especially if you don't have this device in front of you, to use these videos to form a decently informed opinion of the module. Maybe compare these sequencers to other sequencers you may already have or you have already seen on my YouTube channel or elsewhere. And indeed, just as a quick reminder, subscribe to this channel so you won't miss the follow-up videos and other videos of other modules I will be uploading uh, as I make them. So, okay, let's get the nerd on and track away! The NerdSec is a 10-track sequencer. And you may say, wait, I can see the screen, I can only see 8 tracks. Okay, the first 6 tracks, and you can see a track label here, they are modular tracks, and per each of these six tracks, you have uh, one trigger output, one CV output, and one modulation output. Modulation output is just another CV output for the one track. So each of these six tracks gives you one trigger, two CV outputs, which is great, and these are one, two, three, four, five, six tracks. Tracks seven and eight are actually double tracks. Track 7 has two sequencing lines. Track 8 has two sequencing lines. So it's 6 plus 2, 8 plus 2, 10. Now, track 7, as you see, modular is the label for the first six tracks. As you go to track 7, changes to sample, and the same for track 8. So yes, that's correct. 7 and 8, they are dedicated to playback and sequence audio samples. You have audio samples, so you can get audio samples from your SD card, and each project can hold 12 different samples. Now, if I go into a pattern, a sample pattern, I will explain about patterns and stuff later. You see, this is track 7, sequence 1, and I have 64 steps for sequence 1, and then I scroll to sequence 2, and I have 64 steps for sequence 2. In this pattern. So I have a sequence 1 and sequence 2, 64 steps on track 7. I have a sample 00, 0 on sequence 2 and I have sample 0, 01 on sequence 2. So yes, if you can play on one track two samples at the same time. Not only that, you can play a different sample per each step if you want to. Yeah, you can treat a different sample with a different effect, more about the effects later, per step. So each of these tracks gives you two sample sequencing tracks and two sample sequencing tracks. In total means you can actually play four audio samples at the same time. For example, on step three, you can have two samples here on sequence one and sequence two, and two samples here on sequence uh, three and four, let's say, you know, for, uh, for uh, track eight. So there you go. Six modular tracks, two sample tracks, two sample tracks, that's 10. And by the way, the two audio samples on uh, track seven, on those two sequences, are summed, mixed together, and come out of output sample seven. Track eight, those two samples, if they happen to play together, they are summed and mixed and come out of output sample 8. And these are your two sample outputs. Okay, uh, just as a quick example, 
all the drum samples and the silly voice you hear when I play some pattern here, they are actually audio samples. I, I can just play uh, these. Let it go. I have a kick here and snare, hats, stuff on these other patterns. Okay. Overall, you can have 175 patterns and each pattern can have its own step length. A pattern can be zero steps in case of an empty pattern, or one, two, three, all the way up to 64 steps per pattern. So yeah, you can have an eight step pattern, a 64 step pattern. Uh, on a track, you could have uh, a 64 uh, steps pattern and on the other track, you may have uh, just one uh, three steps patterns that keeps looping, or you can have a three step pattern and uh, a seven steps pattern and so on, and whatever you want. You can easily change patterns as the sequence is playing. You can isolate a bunch of patterns. For example, look here, I go on this row, I have a few patterns, but there is nothing, there's a gap after. So if I was to play this row, I'm playing this, this pattern, this pattern, and that pattern. And the sequence is not progressing to additional, to following patterns, because there is a gap. So it's an isolated group of patterns. So this is a, a multi-pattern, multi-track loop. Or you can consider this a multi-pattern and a multi-track clip. So yes, you guessed it right again. You can use these and the different screens of the sequencer as a multi-track clip launcher. And you can uh, uh, actually easily replace which pattern is playing your loop live, which is really good live for, let's say that I have this multi-track loop playing and I want to change the one of these sample tracks from pattern 17 to 19, where I have some more uh, snare and hats activated when I want. So I only changed this pattern. So you see how easy it is if you were playing live to just replace some of the content of your clip. And I can go back to the original one if I want to. Back there. Not only that, but I can say, okay, I'm going to keep all these patterns as they are for these tracks, but I want the drum kick patterns uh, to loop between a number of different patterns. So I go to another island of patterns and I start this island while the sequence is playing everything else. And now it goes down to the following pattern, to the following pattern, and back to the beginning of the island for the track. So you can see how easy it is to uh, modify those clips to remix a track live as you play, go with the crowd kind of thing. So yeah, that, that's really cool. It's very uh, effective, very uh, useful uh, live. Or when you are just trying different combinations before uh, you, get, you want to structure uh, the song. Indeed, nothing stops you from not having island and uh, put together your song from beginning to end with your intro section, uh, verse, chorus, whatever. You just don't leave a gap and they would play from beginning to end and then it would loop if you want to. But we are going to have a good look at this sequence screen later in detail in this video. And yes, you can have uh, polyrhythmic tracks, etc. But we will get there eventually. Let's uh, talk about a couple of more generic but important points about the NERDSEC. The NERDSEC is unique. It's different from other Eurorack sequencers right from the start for two main reasons. One, the most obvious reason is that this is a tracker-based sequencer with note events and data presented vertically. If I go inside a pattern, you see the notes, and if I start this pattern, notes scrolls vertically instead going horizontally. And it makes use of hexadecimal values. More about this in a second. So if you're not familiar with uh, music trackers, sequencers like Octamed on the Amiga, Fast Tracker, Renoise, and others, don't worry about it. It's as simple as this. Think of it like a pattern-based sequencer where notes, triggers, CV values are displayed vertically instead of displaying them horizontally. Boom! That's it. This is all the mental shift required to use this without complications of any sort. 
Really, guys, it's that simple. And in this sequencer, now we are in a pattern view, you can scroll through all the steps one at a time, right? Or you can use, let's say, page up and down, uh, 16 steps at a time. So you can go through your 64 steps. This specific pattern, I added a uh, break here. So on step 16, it ends. Now, because this is an isolated pattern, when it reaches step 16, it restarts. Okay, but anyway, what I wanted to say is that per each step, you can see the CV value, you know, your note, this is the pitch of your uh, VCO, the patch. More about each of these things later. The patch is a way to group a number of modifications, edits you want, and save them as a patch, and then you can apply a different patch per step. Uh, tables, again, more about this later, but tables is like having a mini sequencer per step. So yes, you could compose your own arpeggios and have a different arpeggio per step if you want. A trigger, where you can uh, change the length of the trigger and other things you can do with the trigger, delays and stuff. Details all later. Uh, modulation, which is your other CV output, which you could also output a la force. And then effects. You have four effects that can be active all at the same time per step. And if you use the same effect type on another step, it can have a totally different parameter. Effects, it's a, oh, it's a lot of things. It can be simply a pitch change, a glide, a stepped glide, and, and, and other things. You can uh, edit something on another channel from this step, so in this track. So yeah, it's um, very versatile. We're going to look at it properly uh, later or in another uh, video. You also have here, after the four effects, a dedicated groove column. You can change the groove per step. In other words, you change the number of sub steps in a step, making steps longer, shorter. But with this, you can create your own groove, you can create a shuffle. But we look at this properly in a follow up video where we're going to focus on the pattern creation and all the editable parameters. So, what I like about this is that when you are in pattern view, per each step, not only you can see the CV note, but also anything else you would want to see for a direct, immediate, quick access and edit. So I don't need to go to, let's say, pattern gate screen, then change it to the CV screen, then to the table or patch screen, uh, then to the modulation, then to the effect screen. Per each step and for all the steps, everything is there, ready to use. So you can start to see how this could be really quick to use. So what about this hexadecimal values business? Well, okay, some of you may already be familiar with hexadecimal values. I am, because in my previous life, I studied microprocessors and dubbed in programming, but do not worry, you are not required to program in machine code here. If you do not know the meaning of what I just said, good, because you really don't need any of that. Let me give you a quick example. You have a sequencer that shows value ranging between 1 and 127. I'm talking about uh, things like uh, the velocity, uh, the volume level in Cubase, logic, you know, any DAW. You may have another sequencer, or oh, the same sequencer, but a different editing screen that shows values between 1 and 127, not with numbers, but with a graphic bar. So 0 is 0, 64 is kind of mid-range velocity, 1 to 7 is maximum velocity. The same value with a graphic bar, empty bar is 0, half filled bar, it's like your 64, and a full bar is like your 127. So you see, you have a two totally different ways to represent a value, but all you have is a range displayed with numbers between 0 and 127, or the exact same range displayed with a graphic representation, an empty bar, all the way to a full, you know, a filled bar. Now, same with hexadecimal numbers. It's just a range of numbers you can use. Now, instead of being a base 10 number, in a base 10 number, the ones to be normally used, they go to 0 to 9, you know, that's 10 numbers, then it goes to 10, to 19, 20, to 29, etc. With the hexadecimal values, you start from uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, all the way to 0, 9, and then instead of going to 10, it goes to A. So you have 0, A, 0, B, 
to 0f. And this is, you know, 0 is 0, 0 is 0. 0f zero is 15, which is 16 digits, is a base 16. So now there is a turn. It is a change. It goes to 1, 0. 1, 0, 9, a, b, c, d, f. After the f, it goes to 2, 0, and so on. You know, all the way to 9, 0. Then when you get to 9, f, it goes to 8, 0. 8, 0 to a, f, b, 0 to b, f. Uh, if you use up and down, you can do, you know, big increments or change. Anyway, these are numbers. The, all, I, all I'm trying to say, they are just numbers. So if you want to keep your values, or your modulation, or whatever, you know, the, your glide low, you use 0, 0, zero, no, wait, zero, zero is 0, but 0, 1, 0, 2, uh, a little bit higher, you go 1, 0, 1, 1, F. A little bit higher, like a mid-high, you go 3, F. For 0, for 3, for F, go higher, higher value, you go 7, F. Uh, you just use it as a range. Nothing hard to think about. The uh, NerdSec manual goes into some brief overall explanation all of this if you want to read it, you know, have fun, read it. So if I managed to express myself decently enough, you can see that uh, being a tracker-based sequencer and the hexadecimal numbers, yeah, no big deal. It really makes no difference. It's a sequence of events and it has a range of numbers for you too play with, okay? If anything, this specific implementation of a tracker-based vertical scrolling sequencer with all these parameters from CV, triggers, modulation effects, etc., etc., all these uh, parameters that you can uh, quickly access and modify, it can come quite handy. It can make your workflow quite fast and maybe faster than other types of sequencers with a different way, uh, with a different user interface. So this was the first main overall difference between the NerdSec and other sequencer. Again, the tracker based sequencer, vertical scrolling, and hexadecimal numbers. So what about the second main difference I think exists between these and other Eurorack sequencers? Let's move on straight to difference number two. The second main difference between the NerdSec and other sequencers currently available in the Eurorack format, as far as I can remember, unless I'm missing some sequencer, is that uh, the NetSec not only has six tracks for your modular system, where each track has one trigger or gate and two CP outputs, and that's not new in itself in terms of uh, tracks with one gate and two CV. For example, the ER101 has one gate and two CV per uh, track, but only has four tracks. You have six here. Uh, the Eloquence has uh, eight tracks, but only one CV and one gate, of course, per track. So, you know, some has more tracks, some has more outputs. And of course, it's, they are very different in the way they, they work, in the features, and so on. But I'm not talking about the difference in features just, you know, for the gate and CV tracks, which can be substantial between sequencers. But I'm talking about the NerdSec having an additional four sequencing tracks to play back and sequence, of course, samples, audio samples. Now, by XOR Electronics' own statement, this uh, sample playing feature was just an add-on on top of the main CV gate uh, sequencing features. But we will look at that properly in another video. We will look at the limitations, but it may be a very welcome limited add-on with enough flexibility to possibly have a lot of fun. You, know, you can uh, play back these samples, you can add effects, uh, bit crush, you can reverse sample, you can offset, you can reverse the sample halfway through as it's playing. So you can do a number of things. So it may be limited somehow, but it's also nice and versatile in other ways. And that was the key element of this second difference, is that I don't know of any other CB gate sequencer that also has some tracks, in this case four, dedicated to sample playback. For example, here, I wanted a simple uh, beat for this uh, review to check things out, and I didn't need to use a separate sample module or, or large uh, Eurorack sampler or small mono sample playback device, but I see a separate module which costs more money and uses uh, HP space. Within the size of a typical, you know, fully featured sequencer, I have four lines for sequences 
a pattern of sample playback. So that's that's pretty handy, right? Even if it's not a gigabyte of sample memory, it's a kilobyte, but it, it can take care of some of your uh, drum hits, for example, right? Top central section has a good size screen for 80 times 320 pixels. I do find it easy to read and to navigate. It's pretty quick to navigate, to be honest. Dedicated buttons to access a pattern, or if you are not in the sequence screen, button to access the sequence screen, pattern screen. If you have some patch and table, you can access the patch screen, the table screen, the automation screen, where, for example, now I have a couple of LFO on different tracks affecting different things. Uh, more about the uh, patch, table, automation, and even the project screen later as we will be covering each of these screens and features individually. The project screen is, of course, where you can uh, save, load your projects, uh, load uh, samples, for example, and other things like changing the overall tempo, a number of other things. Again, we will look at this into detail uh, later on. Uh, these buttons are actually easy to use. I mean, they are of uh, a good size. I have a fairly big hands and, uh, you know, I can tap individual buttons and do uh, start, stop very easily. Yes, they are a good size. They're not too small that you're going to press two by mistakes. They're not too big. There's a waste of space. Yeah, they're pretty good for, for my hands anyway. So, um, yeah, I think they're funny for everyone. Now, just like on a computer keyboard, this is six buttons, like the number row of buttons on a computer keyboard, they have a second function labeled at the top of each button. And you access this secondary function just by tapping shift when you tap the button. So now we are in, um, let's say I was in the sequence screen and I tap this button where it says project, I am in the project screen. If I do shift tap, I go to the setup screen. And the setup screen is where you can change a few parameters I'm not going to go through this now. Again, we're going to look at each screen individually in, in dedicated videos so they can uh, serve you as a reference whenever you need them, easy to find. So yes, for example, if you are in the sequence screen or in the pattern screen, you could use the nerd functions commands for additional specific tasks. So for example, in pattern screen, I can call, instead, so if I press automate, I go into the automation screen. But if I'm in the pattern screen and I do shift tap, I am in the nerd screen where, for example, yeah, I could edit the pattern name or create a pattern name if it was still unnamed. In this case, you see the pattern name is here. It's called tell, just because this is uh, using the tell harmonic module. So if I do OK, I could change the name. Uh, let's add the space. And I think the tell harmonic is giving me a pad. So let's do tell harmonic pad. And when I'm done, I just do ready. There you go. The name has changed to Telharmonic Pad for uh, this pattern. Okay, so I go pattern. There you go. It's there. Then, if you press Shift, the first button, Shift the second, or Shift the third one, you go into uh, marking. Marking is to select uh, nodes, uh, columns, rows, or if I was in the sequence screen, to select entire groups or individual patterns. I, I will show you how that works um, after. So you can do, you can mark a selection, you can copy. You can paste it or inserting, shifting the rest of the stuff down. You can delete something. For example, here I have a pattern 02. If I do shift delete, the pattern is gone. As simple as that. I'll show you how I'm doing these other things in a second, right? Oh, record. I didn't do record because I, I didn't set this up for recording yet. Recording, yeah, it's better if we do a dedicated video for it. And it's also, I think, the initial implementation of it. So it's quite basic at the moment. Below this first row of buttons, we have uh, this four, which think of this just like your uh, four arrow keys on a computer keyboard. You know, it's just to go around and select stuff, okay? Well, not select, but to move the cursor. Really. You're moving the cursor around the screen in whichever screen you are. If you're in pattern, it's, you know, you can go to a different step, go to a different parameter, and then edit it. This block of buttons down here, that's where we have the shift button we used before. Now, the shift button is not just to access these secondary functions up here. The shift button is also what you use to change values. And it's consistent and easy and quick to use, no matter in which screen you, you are at that moment. So for example, let's say I wanted to add a pattern here. I just hold shift and I can scroll right through all the available patterns. 
or left, you know, if I want to go, if I want to go to an earlier pattern, these are patterns I have already created. Or if you go in a pattern, so let's access this pattern. I'm in a pattern and I want to change values. I can move around with the cursor keys. And let's say I want to change the value of this, uh, mod the modulation value, the CV value on, um, on the first step. I can go through small increment or decrements. If I uh, just do shift right, you see, 601, two, three, four, I can hold down or decrement one unit at a time. You do shift up and down to move uh, in uh, bigger increments. See, 640, 6, 640, 600. Well, it's hexadecimal, so it goes 5, 6, 0, 680, and so on. Yeah, easy enough. So once you use this for a while, you quickly go where you want. Small increments, you want a bigger change, use these keys, get around there, and then refine it with this. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty quick to use. So back to the sequencer. With these arrow keys, you can also scroll uh, one row at a time. So you can scroll for all the uh, rows in your uh, song. But if you want to go up and down uh, all the structure of your song in a quicker way, song or groups or clips, you can use up and down. It's a little bit like the page up and page down on a computer keyboard. So these are 16 rows. And you can move 16 rows at a time. Then we have the OK button. I'm going to use this later in this video when we are going to play around with the sequencer screen and so on. The only two buttons left to talk about are Start and Stop. I left these two at the end because I want to cover these two in more detail in the next section in this video when we look at the sequencer screen in more detail. And that is because you can tap Start and Stop, you can double tap Start and Stop, you can shift start so to do different things you can use a shift start to start a whole row instead just a pattern for example okay he said if i only pressed double start on uh, anyway even if i was here it just starts that pattern oh i forgot to stop it okay so as you can see there is more you can do with these buttons and uh, because it's less complicated than, than it sounds, I prefer to actually show it to you so you can see that you can quickly build, I mean, very quickly build a muscle memory and have control on the start and stopping of patterns or full row patterns. It did not even take me hours of use to get used to this start, stop, shift, double start. I mean, I read it on the manual, I tried, I was creating a little test track, which is the previous video on the YouTube channel. I mean, after a few minutes, I was flying around with a start stop building the track. So it's really, yeah, you will get it quickly. To the left, we have the four CV or gate inputs. CV values range 0 to 10 volts. Now, what are these inputs for? Well, you can use them to record uh, values into the sequencer. Now, we didn't look at record yet, of course. We're going to have a dedicated video for that. But if I go to the project screen, you see we have a record settings here. If I access those, you can see that for each of the inputs, I could uh, use a CV1 to record notes, no CV values for the track one or two, three, four, track five, six, modulation for any of the track, of the six tracks. This is for the modular tracks and all the sample tracks. Or to record gates, triggers, and for the sample tracks, you can uh, change the pitch of the any of the four samples or the gate for the four samples. So you know there is a, there are a few options. Now this record settings, the record functionality itself of MIDI as well. This is the first implementation in the current firmware. My understanding uh, from Exor Electronics posts on forums and social media is that uh, there uh, uh, all of this will be announced with uh, further uh, firmware updates. In the video, I will cover, not this video, the next videos and so on, I will cover whatever feature is there for the recording features. And then as more updates are released, I, you know, I will be doing uh, possibly update videos so that we can keep up with this uh, sequencer development. And these four inputs are not just to record CB gates into your patterns. They are also a source of uh, modulation control over um, 
one or more parameters of one or more of your tracks. And you do that through the automation menu. Let's get a track playing. So track three. Okay, just some bass sound type of. Let's go to the automation. And uh, I want to use not an LF, no, these are internal LFOs. We look at this another time. Envelopes are not implemented yet, but it's interesting that they have to come because it would be nice to have uh, envelopes inside the sequencer to control parameters. But anyway, so I'm using now CV1 and I want it to activate it, right? I want it to function. And this is like a matrix editor, right? So I want to send it to any of these inputs, including the sample, sorry, any of these uh, tracks, including the sample tracks. So in this case, we are on track three. Uh, you see, you know, see how easy it is to go from one thing to the other, right? So on track three, and I want to uh, use this control, this uh, uh, voltage source to change the pitch, for example. Now, I don't have a quantizer after that voice, so the pitch is gonna be you know, all over the place. But you know, you can use this to easily transpose well, you can transpose with the sequencer, but you know, if you want to external control on that, or I could use it maybe not on the uh, pitch CV, on the modulation output that in this case, my modulation output on track three is actually going to control the uh, closing and opening of the VCA, actually VCA and VCF at the same time. So you could use it to control volume, for example. or maybe the glide, just choosing some parameters that are easy to hear. And of course you can uh, delete or you know, just stop the input if you don't want it. Uh, and, and, and of course you can use any of the four inputs. And uh, by the way, this is also true for, uh, okay, let me stop the sequencer, we don't need it now. This is also true for, uh, know, to add some CV source control to your samples. So for example, track seven and eight, each have two uh, sequencing sample tracks, and you could have this CV input uh, modifying uh, the pitch of the sample, one or two, you know, two samples on each of these tracks, uh, the volume of uh, those two samples, the bit crash effect, the distortion, position, like the offset of the sample, uh, well, the position really, um, and other things like effects, probability, and so on. We're going to look at all, you know, all this stuff in a, a video dedicated to the automation uh, metrics, to the automation screen and options. So, yeah. Okay. In the bottom left corner, we have the clock related inputs the clock input and the clock reset input. Uh, five volts for this input, and the LED showing the clock rate. Top right, we have the SD card, and this one, um, well, you know, you can use this to load, save projects, uh, load menu. I only have two projects on this card now. Uh, fast save, you can save as, change name and save a copy. You can save with backup as well. You can load samples from the SD card. And these are your uh, slots uh, to move samples from the SD card to your project. And you have uh, 200 kilobytes available on the NASDAQ for sample playback. But we look at the SD card in more detail in a later video. And to the right, you have your six uh, rows of the CV trigger mod output. So it's one trigger gate and two. CV's outputs per track for your first six modular tracks. One, two, three, four, five, and six. These outputs are minus five to plus five volts or zero to 10 volts. And these are the switches to offset the CV for those voltage ranges of the modulation outputs, which is another CV output for the offset of these modulation outputs. The gates, trigger gate outputs are five volts. We mentioned before, track seven, two sequencing playback, sample playback lines that are coming out of output sample seven. 
For track 8, the two sample sequencing lines come out of output sample 8. And uh, bottom right, uh, you get the output clock LED, the clock output and the reset output 5 volts. And uh, yeah, when you press uh, stop, you know, your sequence is playing, you press stop. Uh, that's when you send a clock reset for your uh, chain, you know, whatever is down the line, waiting for that clock reset. There are options uh, to uh, have other things happening when you press a stop, like uh, resetting the effects, modulation, or whatever, but we will look at that in due time in the following up videos. So this is an easy to grasp layout, really. Inputs on the left side, CV gates inputs and clock inputs, screen and controls in the middle section, good sides for the screen, good sides for the buttons, the SD card up here, and then all the outputs on the right side. Pretty clear and familiar layout, familiar in terms of uh, arrow keys and you know fam familiarity with a computer keyboard. I like its simplicity, immediacy. From the first few minutes I started using it, I never felt like I had to try and guess where things could be. I mean, everything is in front of you, so there is no much to guess. Uh, so yeah, for me, in terms of user interface, so far, so good. Since we are talking about the physical aspects, you know, the panel layout, we may as well mention now the expander modules. This is the first available expander module for the NerdSec, and it's an input output expander in terms of MIDI in and MIDI out connection, plus a SEGA uh, gamepad connector, which I have not used it yet. I think I might have one stored somewhere in a box. I'll have to try as soon as possible. Uh, it's a, uh, so you can connect a gamepad to probably control the sequencer when uh, during a live performance and so on. Uh, you may have noticed uh, when we went into the project screen, there is a MIDI input uh, setting here, or when we were into the uh, record settings, where you could record CV and gates inputs from these inputs, but there is also a MIDI record option here. As far as I know, I have not used it yet. I will use this in the next few days, possibly, and have a video dedicated to this module. But as far as I know, this is a first firmware implementation of uh, this expander, and uh, there will be firmware updates announcing the features, the functionality of this MIDI input output expander. Uh, but that's not all. There is also another expander connector at the back for special NerdSec extensions. And these are supposed to allow you to have up to 64 more outputs, which is very interesting. And another, another type of expansion is the NSA, Nerd Sound Adapter. And um, this is a, another module, I guess, which will allow you to insert cartridges, and each cartridge is a, an actual full uh, synthesizer. And once used, it will be integrated into the NerdSec sequencer. And this is under development. Uh, this is the only module, as far as I know, that you can buy right now as an expansion for the NerdSec as part of this expanding NerdSec system. So you have a modularity within this sequencer system. You can add a MIDI in out uh, expansion, you can uh, uh, increase the number of outputs, so you can have these cartridges, which will give you synth voices integrated with the sequencer. So you're going to have a CV gate trigger sequencer with a MIDI input and output and synth voices, plus you already have sample playback sequencing, 200 kilobytes sample RAM. So yeah, sequencer, synth voice, sample playback, MIDI in, out, additional outputs. That's a pretty cool, self-sufficient in a way, mini system within your Eurorack overall system. So that sounds all very uh, exciting. I'm very interested in seeing further development here and see where it goes. So yeah, it's uh, all very cool. <laughs> take a good look at the main sequencer screen so we can see how to sequence patterns, tracks, mute solo sections, and so on. And to help this video to give a better understanding of what's going on on screen, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of the actual overall patch so you can see how each track relates to a voice and maybe how I'm using some of the pattern edits in terms of modulation and LFO as well 
to take care of some of the sounds in this patch. Okay, on track one, I have a few simple patterns. It's four. Okay, and I have the CV output of track one going into the tonic input on the make noise telharmonic. Both outputs, the harmonic and the phase mode output, go into the AJH synth uh, V shape. Yeah, I'm using the shape input and the distortion input, and I'm taking both. Well, I'm applying some shaping, some distortion, and I'm taking both the shaped output and the distorted output, and sending them into the AJH synth waves world to add some uh, thickness. The combined output of the wave swarm goes to the channel one on the Sputnik modular called VCF VCA and it's set to combo mode so it's a VCA and a little bit of filter even if it's closed really. Okay now as you can see on track one I'm not using the trigger output but what I'm doing if I go into the pattern I can show you I'm just playing at the beginning of a, a pattern a note. So this is like a held note. The note will just keep playing. And I'm using the modulation output to actually manually program the opening and closing of the VCA. And with these values, I can choose how much the VCA is opened. Okay? So I'm sending this modulation, these CV values really, to the VCA and opening and closing the VCA. So I'm creating my own rhythmic uh, stuttering. And doing it this way, you can uh, create a up to 64 steps pattern with just your, your program stuttering. You can have it last longer, shorter, faster repeats. Uh, yeah, it's just a way of doing these type of things. And if you want to know more about the AJH synth uh, V-shape, Waveswarm or any of these other AJH synth modules, Ring SM, Mega Phase 12, Gemini 2412, and the finalized REQ. Uh, these are my modules. I have a video review, an in depth walkthrough of each of these AJH synth modules and more of them as well. So yeah, just check the channel, they're all there. Track 2. We have the CV output of track 2 going into the 1 volt per octave input on the Pico VCO. The output of the Pico VCO goes into the input of the Pico DSP. And I'm only taking the left output of the Pico DSP, which then goes into the VCA. And the VCA to the uh, DAW. The trigger on, from the second track triggers the 2HP EG envelope. And this envelope from the EG module goes to open and close the uh, VCA, which is set to the VCA is set to combo VCA VCF. There is something else going on with this track two voice. I'm not using the modulation output of track two, just because I was using it for something else. Then I used the modulation of track five to do something on this VCO. I took this cable out because whatever I was doing, I didn't want to do it anymore, and so this is unused. Anyway, I'm using the modulation output of track 5, and I'm not using track 5 for anything else, to send an LFO from the NERDSEC to the WCV input on the Pico VCO. And this is the CV input you can use to control, to scan through the waves on the Pico VCO. So, if we go into the automation, you can see we have an LFO here, and if I uh, play these patterns for you. If I stop the LFO, it's the exact same sequence and it's playing just through one uh, wave voice on this uh, Pico VCO. But if I activate the LFO, it's going to change waves quickly. Creating that kind of uh, stuttered sound. And it's coming out of modulation, output on channel 5, and going into the Pico VCO. So this is another, another example of using an internal LFO to do something on some um, of the other modules. Track 3. I have the CV output of track 3 going into the 1 volt per octave input on the 2HP plug. 
the output of plug goes into channel 2 of this code VCA VCF, which again is set as a combo, so it's a VCF, uh, VCA VCF, and the track 3 trigger goes to trigger the plug, and track 3 seconds CV, you know, the modulation output, goes into the CV input on the VCA, because what I'm doing, again, I'm using uh, my own CV values out of this second CV output for that track to open and close the VCA when I want it, deciding per step, and with values I can decide how much is actually open. But overall, yeah, it's a very simple voice with uh, a sp per step controlled opening of the VCA, VCF. Track 4. The CV output of track 4 is going into the 1 volt per octave input on the Pico, v, uh, Pico Voice. Now, the Pico Voice output is going into the really nice AGH Synth Gemini 2412 dual filter, but I'm all using one filter, and the iPass output goes to the VCA, and the VCA then goes to the AW. Now, the trigger output of this track is uh, going to the gate input on the 2 HP ADSR. This ADSR is controlling the opening and closing of the VCA for this voice. Now, if you listen to the voice, there is some uh, uh, modulation going on, okay? Some uh, change, some movement. So, what I did, I set up the CV input on the Pico voice to control the pulse width modulation on this PWM voice from the Pico voice. I'm using an internal LFO on the automation lines here to control that PWM on that voice. So if I show you here the automation, I'm using this LFO. And actually, if I start the sequence, you can hear what I'm talking about. So I'm using this LFO, which you see is active, on track 4. And 0, 01 means it's sending this parameter to the modulation output of track 4. Modulation output goes into the CV input of the Pico voice. So this LFO is modulating, is changing the PWM on that voice. If I stop the LFO, you see the character of the voice is static. If I activate the LFO, it's going to change the PWM on that voice. Okay. I'm not using track 5 and 6, I'm just using the first 4 of the 6 module tracks. For track 7 and 8, remember you have two sequencing tracks, sample playback sequencing tracks on track 7, they come out of sample 7 autoboot. On track 8, you have another two sequencing sample playback tracks. Anyway, on track 7, I'm using indeed both sequencing tracks. On, uh, on the first one, 7 1, I'm using a 626 bus drum sample. And on the second one, which is 7 2, I'm using a different kick, the R808 kick. And um, these are samples that came on the SD card with the sequencer. So if I, yeah, I, I don't need to go there. If I play the track, I'm triggering both samples at the same time, you know, uh, on the same step for each of these two tracks. And the volume is set to half volume for each sample because they happen to play together. And if you uh, go over the maximum volume, I mean, you start clipping. So having alpha volume each sample, you know, you get the full audio output from this output. On track eight, that's where I have the vox sample, snare, hats, and you know, those percussive sounds. So if I start this once, Let it go! I have a vox sample, which in one of the patterns I'm playing backwards. Uh, there's many effects you can apply of uh, samples like uh, distortion, etc. And in this case, I'm just playing the sample backwards. Yeah, on some other pattern, not doing that. Um, some other pattern is just um, a few uh, closed hats, uh, claps, snare. 
hi-hats, uh, you know, just a few sample triggers, in this case the hi-hats played backwards, but I'm not doing anything uh, special, to be honest, on this uh, uh, track, so just triggering a few samples to have a, a, a percussion set playing. Of course, these are just a few patterns and voices I put together to review the uh, unit and do this video, but you know, it's not like I was trying to make a piece of music. So uh, these patterns together, they could sound something like this. <laughs> you can uh, create, copy, clone, paste, insert and arrange all of your patterns into small clips, loops or a whole song. You do all of these from the sequencer screen. To the left there are your row numbers 0, 0, 1, 0, 2 etc. Uh, you can see 16 rows in one screen and you can uh, scroll through 16 rows at a time with the button up and down, so down, there's the next 16 rows, another 16, all the way down to the end, and you have a total of 240, 240 rows. You can also scroll one at a time gradually by tapping down or holding, um, holding down the arrows up and down. We already mentioned earlier, one, two, three, four, five, six are your modular tracks. 7, 8 are your dual sequencing sample playback tracks. So 4 sample and 6 modular tracks, that's 10 tracks. At the bottom of the screen, this here where it says modular, you always find some uh, useful, meaningful information that usually tells you what is that you are highlighting with your cursor. In this case, I'm highlighting modular tracks. As I go to track 7 and 8, it's telling me that these are sample tracks. Actually, there is just one more thing I wanted to add about navigating around. The way I have it set now, which I think it's a default, when you go all the way to the left, it stops on track one. And when you go to the right, the cursor stops on track eight. If you prefer, you can have the cursor to wrap around. You do that into the setup. Navigation wrap off. You can change that to on. Go back to the sequencer. And now, if I press right, it goes, it wraps around to the other side. Okay. And that's only for left and right, you know, no up and down, which is okay because I guess you want to make sure you can stop at the beginning or, or at the end. So if you want, you can wrap around. I prefer not to, but just personal preference. On the right side of the screen, we have the screen name, sequencer, of course, in this case. Then we have the project name. Uh, that's just the name I gave it when I saved it to the SD card. The BPM for the project. You can edit the BPM for the project in the project screen up here. But it's tempo and you can change these values as you wish. Under the BPM, there is the base general transposition for the whole project. Uh, and again, you can change this here. 
So can transpose the whole project just by adding uh, semitones um, or one octave at a time from this screen. So for example, let's play this track. And if I go to the project screen, if I use shift arrows up and down, I can change by one octave. Up or, you know, more or down. Okay. Or you can change one semitone at a time. Like let's go up a third. seven semitones for a fifth oh back to where we were before and if you had anything here like this you know it would tell you there plus four okay let's put it back to zero underneath the transpose indication you can see it says edit on and you can change this into the project screen and you could change it to off what is edit on and edit off but it's a safety measure. If I have edit off and I'm using this, for example, live, then I cannot, by mistake, change the patterns I have here. I cannot edit the sequence. So if you perform in live and you just want to trigger clips, manage your sequences, with edit off, you know that you're not going to change things by mistake. This area of the screen, it's a feedback on all of the 10 tracks playing. So let's play this section. And, um, so it's a four modular tracks plus the two sample tracks. And for each track, it's telling me which note is currently playing. The red dot on and off, it's the gate on and off for that track. And then this is an indication of the CV present at the, or whatever value is present at the modulation output. So you have CV, trigger gate, modulation output for each track. I don't have anything going on on track 5 and 6, so there is nothing going on here. It also shows you which sample is playing on any of those four sample playback sequencing lines. Now I'm only using three sample sequencing lines. I'm using two on track seven and one on track eight. And it's telling me that on track one, I'm playing just sample zero one. Here I'm playing zero zero. So uh, they come out of uh, output seven. And on um, track eight, well, it's a few different samples because uh, there is a hard kick snare, and with every hit, it tells me which sample is playing. So you get a good overview of what's going on, and if you hear something strange, or, or maybe you were expecting some modulation out of a track and nothing's happening, you can actually see straight away if there is any modulation going on, or it is coming out of the NERSEC or not. So yeah, that's pretty cool. These numbers down here, it's a clock, really. It tells you the sequencer running time. So if I was to uh, start the sequencer, uh, anywhere. As he plays, counts up seconds, minutes, hours, whatever. As long as the clock, the sequencer clock is running, this keeps counting. Now this is useful. Of course, for example, let's say you're performing live and uh, you have only a specific time slot, 20 minutes, 40 minutes. Well, you can see when it's about time for you to get out of there. That's <laughs> useful for that. Or maybe you can check with this timer how long before your audience starts to walk out on you because they can't take any of your music anymore. And so maybe next time you perform, you try to, bet, no, to, 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 to perform better, see if you can increase your records in terms of uh, retention of uh, crowd on the dance floor. Uh, but yeah, anyway, good, uh, better luck next time. <laughs> Now, never mind this uh, out of focus area up here. I want to show you the clock bar in a way. Okay, so let me start the sequencer. If you pay attention to the bottom and to the top, these are your uh, clock steps 64 moving on, ticking over. Okay, so what's this bar good for? Well, of course, it's a general uh, clue about uh, the clock speed where the clock is in a, uh, let's say, in a loop of uh, 64 steps. Now, if you look closer, you can see that every now and then there is a special step of a different color. Now, by default, and I think it's the default, that's the way I have set it now anyway, I have this uh, special key step every 16 steps. Now, that works for me because uh, sometimes uh, some of my patterns are only 16 steps. So if I was to start something, then I would have a visual clue 
And not only I have a line here, the white line that goes to the next pattern, so you know which pattern is playing, but knowing that um, I have a special step every 16, I also know when the pattern is about to end and change to the next or loop over. Right, it's a visual clue. But this is about more than just visual clues for the single patterns. Uh, let's start the sequence again, so the clock is moving along. Now pay attention to this. Now this is what happens when you press the start button just once. When you start a pattern, any pattern, it's only going to start at the beginning of this 64 step length. Now that's useful if the timing fits your needs, because of course it means you could, for example, prepare a number of patterns to start all together at the beginning of this 64 steps bar. So let's say I was here and I wanted to start uh, these, 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 and these. And then start all together when I was expecting them to start all together. Now, let's say uh, let's, yeah, the sequencer is running, maybe you have tracks running. Let's say I have uh, this uh, hats and snare running and I want to start the kick pattern but I don't want the kick pattern to start uh, yeah like let's say I'm around here and I don't want to wait all these steps before it starts I want it to start to start these kicks as soon as I can to start things earlier you don't tap start you double tap start so let's see what happens I'll do it again. I'll double tap start here. Okay. When you double tap something, it will start whenever the next special step is on this bar. So these special steps are the earliest you can start a pattern once you trigger it with a double start. Now you could say, oh, that's cool. Because, of course, I can see when that's going to happen again, and this, of course, quicker and earlier, I mean, than having to wait 64 steps. But what if I wanted, I want things to start even quicker when I double tap? Okay, you can do that. You can do whatever you want. So you go to project, and you can edit the live quantize parameter. As you can see, it's set to 16 steps now. And if you remember, we had this special quantize step every 16 steps. So that the special key step that I was talking about is a quantize, a live quantize step. Now, if I wanted really a more, more granular possibility of starting uh, patterns, then I can change this to any number, let's say eight. Okay, so let's start the sequencer. And you can see now that these special quantizing steps for the start of new patterns are every eight steps. So let's say I have this already playing. And I want to start the kick. It was, uh, we start on the next available quantizer step. So I double tap start, and it starts there. Let's say I tap it here. Okay. I double tap uh, here, and it starts on the next quantizer step. Let's call it quantizer step. Now let's go back to 16. Oh, of course, you know you could have it set on one, and in this case, let's start the sequencer. And let's uh, double tap uh, this and this. Stop this. And then we start again. So it, it starts when you double type it, when you, when you double tap start. But that means you have to quantize things by hand, right? So in most cases, maybe eight or 16, it's a sensible number for uh, time the triggering of one or more patterns altogether. So what about stopping patterns? Well, stopping patterns, let's start the sequencer. It's not related to this quantizer step. You can stop a pattern, a single pattern, or a track anyway, in two ways. Let's say we have this tracks playing, kick and snare, and I want to step, uh, sorry, I want to stop the kick. At the moment, this bar is showing 16 step chunks. So if I press stop here, it didn't stop straight away. That because when you press stop on a track, it will stop the currently 
playing pattern at the end of that specific pattern on step length. So because this pattern is 16 steps, I press stop once, it will stop, but whenever it reaches the end of its own step length. So if I press stop towards the end, it will feel like it's stopping quicker. But if it's at the beginning of a 64 steps pattern and I press stop once, it's still going to go through those 64 steps and then stop. So you won't loop and you won't move to the next pattern if there was a pattern underneath. To stop it earlier, as you may already guessed, you double tap stop. And that will stop, it just stops immediately. So let's say I'm having these things playing and I want to stop the kick. Let's figure it again. I want to stop the hats and snare. It stops when you double tap. Let's talk about single tracks first. You can place the cursor on any track and uh, you can start any track playing just by pressing start when the cursor is there. You don't even have to highlight a specific pattern. Indeed, if you place the cursor on a specific pattern and press start, I will double tap start to start things quicker. So if I start with an highlighted pattern, it will play that pattern. If I press start on an empty slot, the sequencer will start playing the first available pattern on top of the cursor, which in this case is this one, right? So my cursor was not on the pattern, but because this was the first available pattern above my cursor, that's where it starts from. So if I place my cursor here and I start this track, it will play this pattern first because this is the first available pattern above my cursor. Okay? And when uh, that pattern is finished, it was 16 steps, it goes to the beginning of this loop. And I'll explain this loop in a moment. So if you have a, a pattern and there is nothing above or above it, it's just an isolated pattern, all the sequencer does, it will loop this pattern over and over again. Like in this case, this is just one kick pattern. And, you know, and it just keeps repeating that pattern. The way you create a, a single track extended loops, a loop that goes over more patterns, is just by placing one pattern after the other. In this case, I have uh, four patterns attached in a way, you know, there is no gap in between them. So if I start from there, place that pattern fully, then it goes to the next one, and so on, and so on. And at the end of this last pattern, there is nothing below it, so the only way it has to go is back to the top. And now these are called islands. So you can create your own islands of uh, one, two, any number of patterns that follow each other vertically, and the sequencer will keep playing to, into the next pattern until there is nothing there, and then it goes back to the top. Now, keep in mind that within pattern editing, with these effect columns, you have uh, four effects you can have per step. You can have things like uh, uh, break the pattern earlier or jump to another step in that pattern. So you can still modify how, you know, some patterns play, where it goes next, uh, with some individual parameters, uh, step parameters within the patterns. But for now, we're just talking about looping all patterns in the sequencer. So what if you want to start an entire row? Okay, uh, simple. Instead of pressing start, you press shift start. If shift starts, it will start whatever is available for that row. So it starts all the patterns on that row. And to stop all of them, you do shift stop. Because if you only do stop, you only stop an individual pattern, which is great, because you can use this to bring parts in and out, of course. Let's say it was all playing together, and you want to stop the whole row, doesn't matter where the cursor is on that row. Oh, sorry, I started. I mean, I mean, if you want to stop it, you stop it. Okay, just a sample. It was keep playing until his uh, decay was or release was finished. Okay. Now, the reason why 
it was only playing these tracks when I started this row. It's because above the cursor, there is nothing in these other tracks. Indeed, if I was to start the row here, you see, this is an empty row, there is nothing there. When there is nothing and I start an entire row, it's going to look for the first available pattern above the cursor for the entire row because I'm pressing shift start, not just start. Remember, just start is whatever is available on that track. If shift start is for the row. So if I press shift start on this empty row, it will look for whatever is available above the cursor in the whole row, which means in all the tracks. Right? That's a quick way to start whatever is above you. Which means, of course, you know, you could have started it here. And then you would have started this, 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 and this. And so this uh, island concept, it's very efficient because you can create any island, any group of uh, patterns. And as long as there is a gap, whatever is above this gap, and in between gaps, you know, top and bottom, represents a, a, an isolated multi-part, multi-track clip. So for example, I have this island up here, which has an isolated pattern on track one, an isolated, uh, nothing on pattern seven on this specific row, nothing above because it's the first row, but the snares and hats and, and the um, voice, there is a, a vertical sequence of patterns. So if I start this island, it's going to loop this over and over again, but it's going to go through all these patterns. And this is my first island and go back up there. Now, I could have actually started the island here and that would start the kick as well. See, whatever is available on the row and above and it goes that way. But at the same time, if I started here, I can trigger the kick on any time. You know, so you can build up your track as you, as you wish, really. And then if I want, I can jump to this other island. Okay. And then, okay, then of course, in this case, I have a bigger island up here. So there is a gap up here, you see there is nothing up here, there is a gap, huh? and then there is a gap down here. This means that this four will keep looping, this will loop over more patterns, and this will loop this four, this track will loop this four. The kick just repeats one pattern, and snare hats, etc. It's a, a vertical sequence of four. Also, these patterns up to here on this track, there are 16 steps patterns. Pattern 13, which I repeated twice here, is actually a 64 step pattern. So you will see that when this starts, then it will last for uh, 64 steps. You, know, you see going on and so on. And then it goes to the next pattern. If you paid attention to the bar, you see that it actually changes here because the sequence was running when I triggered the start, so it starts from there, that's all. Now, the cool thing as well is that while these parts are playing, while an island is playing, I can, live, for example, change my clip. So let's say I want to replace this sequence of four patterns, which is my pluck baseline. I want to change it with that. So I'm going to trigger that. And I modified a pre-made clip just by replacing pattern or patterns within a track. And then I want it to start again. And then I could explain this. I can go there. And the plug comes back in with this uh, default pattern sequence. 
Another thing I should mention is that when you press shift stop to stop a loop, uh, this initiates a reset pulse on the reset output and also resets all the gates. And there is an option in the settings where you can uh, have it to so you reset all the effects on the sequences on the sequencer stop. So you can have that too if you prefer it that way. It's off now, but yeah, whatever you can put it on. So all the effects, states, uh, values get reset. So when you play again, it starts from scratch. The sequencer screen is where you want, where you need to be if you want to create new patterns, clone them, apply variations and have it as a separate pattern, delete patterns. To create a new pattern, you go on any empty slot and press OK. That's it, it created a new pattern. Once it's created, you could go into the pattern screen, add notes, patch stables, triggers, modulation, any of the four effects per step, you just create your pattern here. Also, while in the pattern screen for this newly created pattern, if you want more than just a number like 1E, you could call the nerd screen and uh, give it a name. Okay? Okay, and call it... Um, Let's spell it, uh, let's call it, uh, oh, I'm, I feel creative today. Let's call it my my pat. Ready, there you go. And the name appears there in the pattern. Back to the sequencer. With shift left and right, as in other screens, you scroll by one unit at a time, so one pattern at a time. Uh, but you can use a shift cursor up and down to go to jump a bigger number of patterns. And then once you are on a bigger number, you can get closer to where you want and so on. Yep, this last one was uh, my pattern. Now, if you noticed, if I go down to the first available pattern, it stops to zero two. The reason is that uh, I already created pattern zero zero and 01 as uh, sample-based sequencer patterns. Now, you can use any pattern created on any of these six tracks, on any of the six tracks. For example, pattern 02 is one of the original patterns I created for the telharmonic voice, which in this case is just playing a G2 note and then stuttering with you know, opening and closing the VCA. But I can place that pattern on any other track, like I did there, and it could be here. And we simply play that pattern, you know, those CV, those modulation per step data and so on, with whichever voice you have connected on the track, as long as you have a voice on the track. But remember that it's still the original 02 pattern. So if I was to edit this pattern for this voice, I would change the original, right? So 02 changes for everywhere it's used. What you cannot do, and that's why it stopped at 02, is use modular tracks, sorry, modular patterns on sample-based patterns, and vice versa. You cannot use sample-based patterns on modular tracks because the data is different, so they wouldn't necessarily work for now anyway with this firmware. But yeah, you could, for example, have uh, this pattern you created here for uh, the snare hats and so on. You could put it on the kick track and see what that sounds like. So the fact that you can use a pattern created anywhere on any of the other available tracks, just by calling it there. It's excellent because it's a very quick way to see how another voice sounds with those notes and so on. To delete a pattern, you just go on the pattern and uh, do shift, delete, that's it, it's gone. Now, what do you do, what you're actually doing when you do shift, delete, you are removing the pattern from the sequencer. You are not deleting the actual pattern from memory. To delete pattern from memory, you do that in the setup screen, but uh, you know, compacting memory and so on. Uh, but as far as I know, that's not implemented yet because I tried it, it didn't work. And that's actually explained on the uh, documentation and so on. It's not, it's not implemented yet, that's all. So it will be implemented in a further firmware, I think. I don't think it's on this firmware, but it will come anyway if it's not there. So you can delete a pattern and free up some memory, I guess. But anyway, 
uh, to remove patterns from the sequencer, you just do shift delete. And if you want to place it back, you place it back. Now let's say you have this pattern 08. Let's put it here. Uh, maybe let's do 0 B. This has got more notes in it. Let's play this pattern. Okay. Let's say you wanted to create a variation of this pattern. And this is the pattern. And you don't want to go create a new pattern and then trying to uh, replicate the same notes and then just edit a few you know, all by hand from an empty pattern. No, what you can do is clone that pattern, which creates an independent copy of this pattern into a new pattern. And I'll do it right now. So this is 0 B. I'll uh, press Shift OK. Remember, it's OK to create a pattern. It's Shift OK to create a cloned pattern. So the original will be, will be there. But if I wanted a variation of the pattern there, I cloned it. And now I have this pattern here. And I could change it. Let me delete a few notes so we know that uh, this is not there anymore. OK. And now if I. Uh, let me put so zero B. So this was the original pattern, which is still there. And this one is the cloned pattern without all these notes we deleted down here. So cloning patterns is very, very useful because it allows you to create variations of existing patterns really quick. Just clone the existing one, change the notes you want to change, change the modulation, and uh, move on from there, and that's it, you got variations going. You don't want any of that anymore, delete, delete. And so what about uh, copying, pasting, inserting patterns, groups of patterns, and so on? Well, yeah, it's all here, and it's also uh, pretty fast to do. So let's say you want to copy this whole row somewhere else. You just do Shift, Mark, and you see the edge of the screen has gone red. Move the cursor where is the end of your selection and mark it again. That's it, it's copied to the clipboard. Then you go wherever you want to paste that row. I do Shift, Copy, and that's it. Copied clipboard. Keep in mind that when you paste something, it overwrites whatever was there before. So if you had something already there, you are actually overwriting it. Of course, it didn't have to be a whole row. You could just copy the one pattern and uh, paste it somewhere else. But a single pattern, it's quick enough to just um, let's say, delete it. You go there and choose the pattern you want. You can copy as little or as much as you want, right? So let's copy for this example. Oh, yeah, these three rows. OK, copy it. Now let's add them here below that line. There you go. They are there. I did this because I wanted to show you the insert. So let's say I want this uh, specific row. And I want it here at this row. But I don't want to overwrite this row. I want to insert it in between the previous row and this row. What I do, it's shift down copy. So it moves down whatever was at that row, making space for your new row. And again, it did not have to be the row. It could be just, you know, two, three patterns over two, one, three rows, whatever you copy. You can just paste it or insert it where you want. Another thing you can do is. Um, this. But you know that if I do shift delete, it will remove the pattern from that slot. Let's put the pattern back there. What if uh, I want to delete this, but I also want these three patterns to move up? Because I want them to move up and maybe do something else at the bottom. So you do instead shift delete, you do shift up delete. And the pattern that was there is gone, and whatever was below it. Has moved up. That's you know another very useful feature to quickly edit things in the shape that you want. 
and you could also do that for the for a row market oh, sorry market and then you do shift up delete the whole row is gone and everything below has gone up so it's very flexible in uh, i mean it's, it's really good such a big screen to uh, quickly arrange patterns in groups in clips copy paste insert move things up move things down i don't think you have this kind of flexibility on any other sequencer you know a, a screen that allows you to do all of this with patterns and moving them around it's it's pretty cool it's pretty cool and if i wanted to delete all this mess i just created i'll mark this section and i'll do shift delete that's it it's all gone nice and clean as it was before oh by the way if you are wondering if there is an undo function yes there is it's in the nerdy special options so from uh, the sequence screen or even in a pattern screen you just do shift nerd and there you go you have your undo here on top of the random value and other bits and bobs yeah, in the sequence screen the same you just nerd and you can undo things keep in mind that you only have one level of undo but hey better than not having one right so cool on top of uh, starting rows clips changing patterns in the clip as the sequence is playing you can also mute a mute tracks uh, solo and solo tracks so let's start the sequence to mute tracks it's shift down start so it's down shift down start to mute and the muted tracks are darkened on the screen hopefully you can see that on the video to unmute a track it's the same command so it's the same to mute and unmute which makes sense it's just like a mute button and if you have more than one track muted and you want to unmute all of them at the same time you just do shift up start twice and it unmutes all of them shift up start it's also the common to solo a track and then if you unsolo the track it will unmute all the others that just watching my actions uh, because you are watching a video these actions may look more complicated than what they really are and i'm not talking just about the muting and muting i'm talking about copy pasting editing a lot of parameters and so on but yeah stuff really on the video looks more complicated than what it really is i assure you that in my personal experience anyway with navigating creating copying pasting in this screen or within a pattern etc it's all been very smooth it felt really quick right from the start, which I think is a, a key feeling I wanted to put across, at least mention anyway. Uh, it just felt easy to use from the beginning. I just went through some more instructions, I tried a few things, and uh, as you do them, you realize how explicit things are because of the big screen and because everything is named and displayed properly. So yeah, it's, it's pretty good. You always have to consider that in a video I'm doing while explaining, so some things may feel it to be slower or less natural but this all boils down to just a few keystrokes muscle memory and actually muscle memory kicks in really quick and you will be flying around this screen in no time That's it for today. We took a good high level look at the overall features of the NerdSec, the main screens, but we only mentioned some of the cool stuff like per step effects, like uh, modifying a CV or a trigger value on another track from a step of a different track, uh, glide, probability values, tables, patches, a lot of stuff that can be done here, uh, but we're gonna look at that next. 
Indeed, in the next video, we are going to build a few patterns from scratch. We will try out all the additional features like a glide, the light rings, etc. Maybe we'll build some arpeggio in the tables. And you can have arpeggio in tables or whatever you can do with a table per step, so that's pretty cool. We are going to check uh, all the features in the sample sequencer tracks as well, the sample specific effects. And there will surely be more to talk about, which means we will very probably need a further video and so on. Okay, guys, remember to subscribe and click on um, the little bell on my main YouTube channel page. There is a little bell on the top right corner. If you click that and subscribe, you will receive notifications of when the next video for the NerdSec or other uh, modules will be released, so you're not going to miss them. It should be great. Leave comments and questions below, I'll try to answer them. And please like and share this video, I would really appreciate your help with likes and share. Share on your Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, more people, you know, so more people will be able to join these conversations. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter for more snippets and shorter clips in my upload on those platforms because I'm uh, do a quick patch or shorter clips and they may be too long to put on YouTube. So I might just, you know, do quick uploads on Instagram and Twitter now and then. And we can uh, have a chat on those channels as well. So, thank you for watching and until next time, have fun and keep Euro rocking. Bye.